Freddy Laker's next adventure would be a titanic struggle. He would become the people's champion, but in the end, it would destroy his business career. Laker wanted to break into the big time, transatlantic travel, but it was a pipe dream at that time. The transatlantic routes were dominated by established airlines, including what is now British Airways and the US giant Pan Am. The establishment were very keen on keeping things exactly the way they were, fixing fares between them, having discussions about uh, the maximum size of a salt cellar that you could have in business class, because it was important not for one airline to have an advantage over another. Although there was little competition in the transatlantic market, there was a loophole in the system which allowed for affinity group charters. These were flights operated for clubs, groups or organizations who were formed for the purpose other than cheap travel, so that if you were a member of the East Molesley Horticultural Society, they would go out and charter a flight for their members. Very quickly, charter operators began to use this as a backdoor route to take on the scheduled airlines. This was a pure sham. We would say, oh, I belong to the uh, Detroit uh, Pigeon Fanciers Association and I'm a member and therefore we've got a, a trip to New York next Tuesday. Of course, most of us never been near Detroit. We certainly didn't fancy pigeons. Um, all we wanted was a cheap flight. Soon, the aviation authorities started random checks on affinity group charters. The Americans and the British employed investigators to come to the airport and say, OK, tell me about your favourite pigeon then. And if you couldn't answer the question, they would say, you're off the flight. Freddie Laker had his own way of dealing with government rules. He got a notary public to go to the airport to stand at the check-in desk and as each passenger checked in, they swore an oath before the notary public that they were members in good standing of the left-handed Canary Club or whatever club it happened to be that was chartering the aircraft. Plainly, this was a nonsense. But Laker's ploy didn't always work. Whenever the authorities thought he was pulling a fast one, he was made to pay a hefty fine. Freddie was determined to find a system which would enable him to control his own business. You can't build a business in an environment where the law is an ass and is being broken every day of the week. Laker wanted to break free of the risky affinity charters and move into the secure scheduled market. But to get a license for this, he had to prove to the authorities that he would not take business away from the established airlines. Laker came up with a new idea. He said, well, if the lack of an advance reservation is enough to separate us from the scheduled airlines, then the authorities should be able to license this. And so the concept of Skytrain was born. It's one of those ideas which suddenly struck him. A no-frills airline, turn up, buy a ticket, board and off you go. Laker argued that his low-cost Skytrain would serve a different type of customer from those flying with the scheduled airlines. What Freddie Laker said was, hey, if you've got a regular job, if you're an ordinary certain person, you can fly the Atlantic. In 1971, Freddie Laker applied for a license to fly the London-New York route, the single busiest international route. Laker's battle on both sides of the Atlantic had begun. He had an excellent Washington lawyer called Bob Beckman. He was very much involved in our British licensing applications, but he also plotted a way through the American regulatory system to bring Skytrain to fruition over there. In 1973, Freddie Laker won his British license from a sympathetic conservative government. But before Skytrain had a chance to take off, the established airlines were fighting back. British Caledonian and British Airways. They were the designated carriers on the North Atlantic routes who had the most to lose if Laker was successful. They would say to the governments in London and in Washington, you cannot possibly allow this person to come in and cut fares. That would be an absolute outrage. The lobbying worked. A year later, a new Labour government revoked the Skytrain license. But Freddie Laker was determined to fight on. He had the name Skytrain 
painted along the fuselage in the characters of the Stars and Stripes and the Union Jack. And he'd said, I will remain the buccaneer and the, the, the name Skytrain will be painted on my planes until the day I die. He hated um, bureaucracy. I mean, he was very much the entrepreneur, the free competition. And he, he lived and died by that creed. And, and as it proved, that's exactly what happened. Laker took the British government to court on the grounds that they'd exceeded their legal powers. The media had found a new star. Freddie Laker was no longer just an entrepreneur. He was becoming the people's champion. They saw him as a great crusader. They liked the, the way that uh, he was proposing to give the, the little man a chance. It wasn't all altruistic. It would always be with one eye on the television camera and the other on the commercial future. <laughs> Freddie recognized that in fighting this battle, he could maintain the profile of Laker Airways and keep Laker Airways in the news and keep people talking about Laker Airways. Laker was winning the public relations battle in Britain as well as in the US. He appeared before Ted Kennedy, who held an inquiry into aviation at one stage. Um, he'd go and make speeches before the Wings Club in Washington. Um, and all the time he would be promoting the idea of Skytrain. Laker would fight his legal battle for over five years. The courts finally ruled that the British government had exceeded its powers in revoking Skytrain's license. Freddie Laker had won. On 26 September 1977, Skytrain was finally airborne. You needed someone who was so stubborn that every time the British or the American government said, no, you can't do that, oh, no, no, we can't have any competition, he refused to accept that. He would keep banging on and on and on until he just wore down the opposition and they said, OK, Freddie, you're on. Freddie Laker, the rebel who took on the government, made history by rewriting the aviation rulebook. But Laker's victory was short-lived. He'd made powerful enemies, and they were ready to fight back. 